Good evening and welcome to the Board and Mayor of Mayor and Alderman Workshop. It is June 2nd, 2022 and it is 6.30 p.m. Call this workshop to order. Uh, the prayer on Tuesday night will be with Alderman Waldron, the Pledge of Allegiance with Vice Mayor No. Um, everyone should have a copy of the minutes from the May 5th, 2022 public hearing and regular meeting in your packets. We will have one presentation on Tuesday, which is the Laverne High School boys soccer team. And we will have departmental reports. Then moving on to old business, second reading ordinance 2022-10, an ordinance to amend the city of Laverne zoning ordinance by changing the official zoning map for tax map 17E group B parcel 23 consisting of approximately 0.49 acres located at 396 Old Nashville Highway from a R1 low density residential zoning district to a C3 neighborhood service commercial zoning district. This received a favorable recommendation from the Planning Commission on March 29th, 2022. A public hearing was held on May 5th for this item. Is there any questions? <coughs> Seeing none. Second reading to ordinance 2022-11, an ordinance to amend Title 18, Chapter 3 of the Laverne Municipal Code regarding the sewer use ordinance. Again, this is second reading. Does anyone have any questions? Second reading ordinance 2022-12. An ordinance to amend the fiscal year 2021-2022 general fund budget. Again, this is second reading. Um, does anyone have any questions? Second reading ordinance 2022-13, an ordinance to amend the fiscal year 2021-2022 stormwater fund budget. Again, this is second reading. Is there any questions? Second reading ordinance 2022-14, an ordinance of the City of Laverne, Tennessee, adopting the annual budget and tax rate for the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2023. A public hearing will be held on Tuesday, June 7th, 2022 at 630 on this. Is there any questions? I will state and Bruce can correct me if I'm wrong, but if memory serves the, yes, it's right here, the um, new tax rate is going to be uh, 0.5363 per $100 of assessed value um, due to the reappraisals. The current, ver or the current rate is 0.71, so this is equalizing it down to that certified rate. Moving on to the consent agenda. Approve city bids and purchases. Ms. Felicia, you're up first. Good evening, Mayor and Alderman. Um, the first item is the is a vehicle for the fire department. It's on state contract. Is it's, it in? I believe it is. The, Thomas has all, they're holding them, right? Yes. Sorry, that, that's been a stickler in the yes. past, so I've got to ask. Well, and um, I was pretty sure Thomas wouldn't have said anything, and he's, he manages to work with him. And this um, is a 2022 Ford Explorer? Yes. Okay. The next one is one for economic development that would have been for, that we're bringing forward. Mm-hmm. No, this, this will still be purchased out of next year's budget after July 1st. Okay. Yeah, it'll be held uh, from what we've got here till July 1st. But they've got that one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the next item is a source well contract for a bat wing finishing mower for the street department. What is a bat wing? Looks like a Batman, but it's a mower. Oh, I got you. <laughs> they wear the mask and everything. Y'all was waiting on my dumb self to ask for it. <laughs> And then we have a heavy duty trailer for the water department. Um, it is under the bid amount and they did, Tom, uh, they did get three quotes or attempted to. If, if they, uh, they've tried, they had two, no responses. Those are still considered um, attempts to get quotes. 
And then, of course, this is a special type of a heavier duty trailer. Okay. Any questions? Thank you. Moving on to B, approved contract with World Turning Band for the Old Timers Festival kickoff concert on September 16th, 2022. Um, this is going to be the 7 p.m. concert, and um, the deposit on this is 2400 and then the other uh, 2400 the day of the show. And this is a Fleetwood Mac band. Does anyone have any questions? C, approve application for the roadblock, uh, for a roadblock to be conducted by Rolling Thunder, Tennessee, Chapter 1, from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Saturday, June 11, 2022, with a rain date of June 18, 2022, at the intersection of Murfreesboro Road and Stones River Road. This is pretty typical. We get these usually each year. Does anyone have any questions? Then moving on to C, approve application for a roadblock to be conducted by the Shriners from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Saturday, July 9th, with a rain date of July 16th, 2022, at the same intersection, uh, Murfreesboro Road and Stones River Road. Does anyone have any questions? I know the Shriners have been here for a number of years, and great organization e approve extension to maintenance and support agreement with endemia identity and security usa llc uh, that's our fingerprint technology is that correct yes sir. yes the fingerprint uh the mobile fingerprint devices uh total cost for this maintenance is um six thousand five hundred and seventy four dollars and um this is for the period of July 1st of this year through June 30th of next year. Does anyone have any questions? Chief, they're already working pretty well as they've been? Yes, well, we already have three of the mobile uh, fingerprint machines, but our stationary one, we need that on a daily basis for arrest. Okay. Then moving on to F, approve supplemental agreement number one to the contract for professional services with Volkert Incorporated. Um, this is an agreement for $24,255. Um, Volkert is the company that we are using to update the city's zoning ordinance, zoning map, and subdivision regulations. Does anyone have any questions on this? Seeing none. Approved facility use agreement with Jacqueline Dixon for the Jazzercise program. Um, does anyone have any questions about this? I know this has come up um, each year for the last couple of years. Moving on to H, approved facility use agreement with Julianne Holbrook for the Zumba program. Again, this is the same type of agreement um, that we've been doing for a while now with them. Does anyone have any questions? Steve, I know you love your Zumba. I need to get in there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Approve agreement for services and statement of work with Locality Media Incorporated DBA First Due <coughs> for fire reporting software. Um, again, this is in your packet. This is um, basically a software uh, to streamline um, multiple data issues with the fire department. Um, it'll replace who they're currently using. It's going to cost $23,600. Does anyone have any questions about it? Approve biller agreement with Invoice Cloud for water billing online account services. This is um, basically a major upgrade to our water billing uh, software because currently you can't see your past bills. You don't have your own account because you just you log in and see what's due each month. You can't go backwards and see what you've paid and whatnot. This software will do that. Um, the fees to the customers should be similar or 
in some cases lower, which is always a good thing. Um, just depends on the form of payment that they're going to use, but um, this is uh, for water billing uh, for water and sewer. Does anyone have any questions? I think this was a great find right here. Moving on to K, a pro proposal for KSI structural engineers to conduct a third party peer review on plans for the storm shelter room in the new fire station 41 building. Um, this is going to be about $3,000. Um, building codes and FEMA require that public safety buildings provide safe areas for the occupants. So um, heaven forbid a tornado hits, you know, our lovely new fire station, um, our firefighters and anyone in the building would have um, a safe place to go to. Does anyone have any questions? Is it, is it sounds awful cheap. This is for them to review um, the plans. Uh, That's exactly what this is for. It's just, just for them to review the hardened area on the ground floor. Do we get some type of document after that review saying it meets the intent or the requirements? Yes, sir. What the, the situation is, is obviously the architect needs someone from the outside to review the plans to make sure that it all meets the standards so it becomes a true third party. So we should get some type of uh, confirmation through them that through the contractor or our architect, um, John Trail, that will be um, providing those services of the construction. So yes, sir, to answer your question. Thanks. Any other questions? How big will that room be? Ronnie? I, I, I don't know. know off the top of my head, but I can tell you it is what is considered the break room from the classroom, which is a 120-person classroom, and we don't have a safe haven for 120 uh, people making that event, but it should house the 14 to 16 people from the fire station upstairs plus the administrative personnel downstairs. Thank you, Chief. Yes, sir. Moving on to L, approved service agreement with iRoll Operations Incorporated for online fire inspection reporting. <clears throat> so um, under our, our current fire code, each building with fire protection systems um, must be inspected twice a year. So uh, by a third party contractor and um, some of them even require quarterly inspections. So. Um, this is a uh, this will serve as a contact point for Laverne Fire and Rescue that uh, the vendors can provide this service. And if you have a business or company that, uh, for whatever reason, fails an inspection, it'll prompt the fire department to have a follow-up inspection. And so, um, the goal for the fire department is to achieve 100% fire protection system compliance here in the city. So um, there is no cost to this service, but it does need to go through the board for approval. Do other cities use this kind of stuff? Some do. Uh, Chief, do you know which cities use this? Uh, yes, sir. Right now, Murfreesboro, correct? So I know the city of Murfreesboro locally does, and it's every single day that a new city comes online with them, and I get an email. So it is a, it is a nationwide service. Um, that helps us become 100% compliant. And that's the goal is, is protection. Wonderful. Any other questions about this? Okay. Uh, moving on to M, approved donation of property from Laverne LF Holdings LLC for property along East near Shriveman Boulevard. Um, we were contacted, uh, the city was contacted by Carol Wilson who represents this company and um, they were stating that they own some property along each side of East near Shrapman Boulevard. So, and it's adjacent, one of them is adjacent to property that we already own. It's not large enough for them to do anything with and they were wanting to transfer those over to us if we're willing to accept it. So um, there is no cost associated with this. It, uh, the only cost that could potentially pop up would be um, recording fees and any title work that may need to be done. But um, essentially this is just adding on land to what we already own. Does anyone have any questions? In approve booking agreement from Pro Entertainment Nashville for a trackless train 
temporary tattoos, and laser tag at the Old Timers Festival on September 17th, 2022. Um, this is for all of those services. It'll be from 10 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Uh, the cost is uh, $4,366.23. And of course, this is already budgeted in the Old Timers uh, Festival budget. And uh, this is just uh, more activities for our youth for that, that event. Does anyone you have any questions? Contract, Evan? Yes, sir. We're good. We're good? We're good. All right. <laughs> we weren't good last year, but we're good this I, year. That's <laughs> why I'm asking. <laughs> Funny enough, that was the first question I asked whenever I, I saw this on the agenda. So it's, 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 it's very straightforward, very basic. So Perfect. Um, then moving on to approved booking agreement from Pro Entertainment Nashville for carriage rides at the Winter Festival. And um, this will be, of course, uh, again from 3 to 8 p.m. And uh, the total cost for this will be uh, $3,200. And it, the funds are available in the programming budget. Does anyone have any questions about this? Where will they ride to and from, David? David, are they um, similar to some of the ones downtown where it's like lit up around it or more of like a, uh, an I'm open? I'm not sure if they're lit up, but they should be open air. Okay. You may have one that's covered, um, purchased two of them or, or have rented two of them. Um, so we have some things in the work that the university it will work out to our benefit um, for us to put some lights on the walking trail that night. <laughs> one can hope and pray any any other questions about this wonderful moving on to new business first reading ordinance 2022-15 an ordinance to amend title 9 chapter 6 section 9-618 of the Vern municipal code regarding the schedule of rates and billing procedures for record services so uh, the city uses a um, a local towing company and uh, they have requested that the rates and fees for towing services be amended the last time that they were amended was back in 2008 and if you can think of any costs that have remained the same since 2008 please let me know um, but due to the uh, increased rates and fees there will be an additional cost to the city for any vehicles that that we need towed um, anything that's wrecked or abandoned um, where the towing uh, company is called by the police department is passed on to the vehicle owner. <coughs> so does anyone have any questions about this? And if you do, we also do have the owner of that company here. Anyone have any questions? 2008, I think that's yeah. a fair <coughs> request. 12 years. <coughs> yes. Uh, more than that, more than that. Uh, Think about inflation just for the last year, much less last 14 year. years. That's what, yeah, sure. 14 years. 14 years yeah. Any questions? Seeing none, moving on to resolution 2012 13, a resolution of the city of Laverne to appropriate funds to nonprofit organizations for fiscal year 2022 2023. The uh, total donation amount for this year is $159,472. Of course, each year we, uh, the city approves um, the appropriation of funds for various nonprofit organizations during the budget process. Um, we've talked with many of them and uh, I've gone through this with multiple budget meetings. Does anyone have any questions? Resolution 2022-14. A resolution to accept the Cottages of Lake Forest Phase 5 sub subdivision. This received a favorable recommendation from the Planning Commission on April 26, 2022. Um, of course, there is no financial impact with this. Um, there will be a one-year maintenance bond on this. Uh, the city, of course, requires that for uh, any infrastructure maintenance uh, for this. Does anyone have any questions? And Kyle, you can confirm everything is good with this phase. Yeah, everything's good. Everything's been punched off the list? Yeah. 
Okay. Any other questions? Resolution 2022-15, a resolution to adopt the 2022 revision of the Rutherford County Hazmat Mitigation Plan. Uh, of course, every five years, Rutherford County and all the municipalities in the county must adopt a revised haz hazardous mitigation plan. This keeps the city eligible for future grant funding, uh, for mitigation programs, including the storm shelter project. So uh, FEMA has reviewed this current revision and has approved it subject to formal approval by the municipalities. There is no financial impact to this. Does anyone have any questions? You answered my questions before I could ask you. <laughs> you are welcome, sir. Resolution 2022-16, a resolution to amend the employee handbook. So uh, for years, the city has not paid overtime to police officers until they reach 43 hours per week or 86 hours per pay period threshold in accordance with federal labor laws. Um, this changes that threshold to 40 per week, 80 per pay period, which is pretty standard across private industry. Um, so the, the change in the threshold should be minimum uh, because the amount is already budgeted. It's um, for straight time, so 80 and 86 hours per pay period uh, for each officer. So this is um, not going to have a, a huge impact on the budget, but um, I think it'll have a big impact with our police officers, with morale as well. Is there any questions? Moving on to 15, motion to approve options from the investment grade audit for the LED streetlight conversion project. We do have some representatives with PATH here who are going to do a presentation. Um, I know you've got some materials for us, and we're going to have some stuff on the screen for everyone as well. All right, thank you for the time. My name is William Franklin with Path Company. I've met some of you guys before. Y'all are probably more familiar, though, with my colleague, Scott Gilmer. Scott's on vacation out west with his family this week, so I told him I'd step in. Scott and I have co-developed this project, though, from the beginning, um, so I'm confident in my ability to accurately relay the information tonight to you. Um, the idea tonight is to kind of recap where we are in this process and then to talk about some of the options that you guys have available so that we can further refine the total project cost and savings figures so that you guys can then make a a fully educated decision you know sometime in the near future as to whether or not you'd like to pursue this project um, so if we'll flip through this presentation you know this this first page is really just a reminder of who path is the biggest point I want to stress to you guys is in the streetlight conversion project space um, particularly in the TVA area we are far and away the most experienced most established firm um, we've listed some of our projects under contract there below um, but we, to date, have completed uh, and have under contract more streetlight projects than all of our competitors combined. So um, we do feel confident in our ability to develop this project for you um, and in the information that we're presenting tonight. Um, if we flip to the next slide, this is just a, a reminder as to where we are in this process. If you all remember, back in July of last year, so almost a year ago, um, you guys approved us to, to move forward with an investment grade audit. The idea, of course, is that there is a conversion project available for the city of Laverne where sa significant savings on your annual streetlight bill might be realized. Based on historical analysis and other um, factors, you know, we presented you guys with that opportunity and said, in order to further refine that, we need to proceed with our investment grade audit. We're here tonight to show you some of those results of that audit with the idea that you guys will then make a decision as to whether or not you'd like to move forward. Um, two quick slides on the work conducted during the audit. So, so this is a quick map. This is actually an interactive map um, where you can zoom in and out of different portions of the city. This is all the data we collected. So we went, sent field representatives throughout the city. They collected a tremendous amount of data. There on the right-hand side of the slide um, is an indication of the amount of data collected for each one of those data points. So it's not just identifying where a light is, right? It's identifying where the light is, what the street classification is, is there a sidewalk, is there not, what's the current wattage, what's the setback, what's the arm angle, et cetera, um, so that we know exactly what exists right now. We then move forward to the next slide, 
where we complete some design steps. So we're now designing a custom application for each one of those locations. So it's not a one size fits all approach to this project. It is very much a what is the right fixture for each application. Um, so that is uh, indicated by kind of the bottom portion of it and then the top this was a process we went through um, with a certain number of city representatives where, you know, through our audit process, there's a lot of data collected and there's some questions that come up, of course, about, hey, is this a security light? Is this a street light? Um, is this actually within the, the city boundaries or is it shortly or, you know, just outside? So we try to refine that scope and make sure we have an accurate idea as to the number of lights that are actually included inside the scope. So now we've got the scope identified. We've got a design picked out. If you guys remember, you went through the mock-up process so now we're to a point where we can start to put some figures to it the core citywide led conversion project cost as it stands today is slated to cost 2.32 million dollars okay with with the net i'm sorry the gross annual savings just right at 160 thousand dollars if you look back if you guys remember when we came and spoke to you um, way back um, before that investment grade audit that, that cost was estimated to be right above $2 million, so it's increased a little bit. The savings were gonna be significantly below that at 139. <coughs> the reason for that increase, it's always a question that we get if you're looking back at that old information, the reason for that increase is the number of lights. At the time before the audit, it was assumed that you guys had roughly 2,200 lights. It's actually been proven now through the field audit that you have just over 2,500. So given that, your actual net savings per light actually increased your total you know, payback period actually came down. So the project's actually a better project than it was slated to be beforehand, even though it actually does cost a little bit more. It's simply because you have more lights. Any questions on this slide? It's a big number to just kind of breeze over here. Also, the big number at the bottom. That's, sure, that's sure. That's very noticeable. 20-year gross project savings of $4.3 million. Absolutely. Very significant for a $2.3 million project. So again, tonight, the idea is, you know, this is the core project at 2.3. There are some options that you guys asked us to take a look at through the course of our investment grade audit that we put prices to that, you know, unfortunately they don't deliver any additional savings because most of these are ads, right? Where we wanted more light present or we wanted to change the existing infrastructure. So there's simply additional costs that you guys might choose to add into the project. So if we flip to the next slide, I believe there's six options in total. Okay, the first is a pretty significant one, right? Which are these knockdowns that continue to occur on I-24. Um, you know, unfortunately, there's a large number of knockdowns. It's a pretty recurring issue. The solution is to, number one, reduce the number of, of fixtures present, of course, to then reduce the number of knockdowns. Also, though, to move those back However, the cost associated with doing so is fairly significant. Um, if you think about that, the cost of the actual infrastructure itself, along with the installation cost of that, it's right at a million dollars for that. So don't, don't, don't hear me not say this, I guess, but in our professional opinion, this might be an option that we might forego at the current moment. Um, significant, again, in cost, delivers no additional savings unless you guys are really perturbed by these knockdowns. Unfortunately, the million dollar price tag seems, seems pretty extensive on that one. Okay, moving on, however, things start to be a little bit more reasonable. So in the residential space, you think about the number of decoratives that you guys have throughout the city. You've got a total of 94 of them. Um, there's two different options here. So one is to retrofit the existing decorative fixture, um, which basically means replacing the bulb, okay? In the LED world, that bulb is called a lamp. It's not simply like an LED lamp that you go pick up at Home Depot. It's a pretty significant piece of infrastructure itself. You can see its picture right there. Um, the slide's a little bit inaccurate because one of the original cons that we associated with that option of a retrofit was that it wasn't approved by NES, who is, of course, one of your primary utility providers. That situation since changed. Um, I would say at this point, we've received preliminary approval for that retrofit option, which is great for you guys. Um, so right now, that retrofit option actually delivers the maximum amount of savings you know, without costing you guys anything extra. Okay. If you guys, however, wanted a different option, you could choose to actually upgrade the fixtures themselves. Um, so this would be completely replacing the fixture. To do that across all 94 fixtures, though, it's going to cost roughly $169,000. So again, no additional savings with that. It's purely a, an aesthetic play at that point, um, if that's something that you guys think would be, you know, <clears throat> desired, right? There was some discussion about whether the city maintains these residential decorative ones 
versus the individual HOAs because uh, one of these, such as like Pinnacle Point, mm-hmm. um, I remember the, the developer originally designed them to be the street lights and then <coughs> found out that wasn't allowed and had to put in regular street lights. So right. um, I'm not sure if, if that was ever determined if, if, the, if that's the resident's side at this point or not. Right. I'm going to let, so I forgot to introduce Nathan Mollick. You guys know him. He's the brains and looks behind this operation. Do you remember what the uh, decision yeah, was on those HOAs? These, these 94 in, but not any additional HOAs. So anything that's additional on top of that, that's decoratives owned by HOAs, is not included in this? Because I can see one of the HOAs that we discussed still in here. Okay. So I would say we, we might want to circle back on that because there's two large ones here. Um, that I would say make up the bulk of this. Okay. All right. Fantastic. We can easily revise that. That's no problem at all. Can you, or I guess, we'll, we'll follow up with you after to make sure, sure. that we get the, the exact ones you're talking of. And we were talking about this before. I, I can't remember. Did we or did we not say that we weren't going to do out by the interstate? We had discussed it. Nothing had, they didn't have any numbers with it fully so we this this is where we're deciding it okay. yeah that's an option we've got here in, inside of this packet I believe and the as mayor Cole stated the four million dollars at the end of 20 years that's under the assumption of everything right now today uh, my I guess my question is what if a light breaks mm-hmm. quits new development more lights how is that yeah it's a good question. So I'll address the, the first part of your question first. Let's talk about failed equipment, right? So there's certain assumptions that we make about failure rates, and then we're actually allocating inside of that forecast maintenance allowances to cover the, the forecast of maintenance associated with those failures. So that does take that part into consideration. What it does not take into consideration is any future growth you guys might experience. So it's based purely on the existing infrastructure. It's impossible um, within reason to accurately forecast that and what it might look like. But based on your current infrastructure, it's going to deliver over $4 million in net savings, um, I'm sorry, in gross savings at the end of 20 years versus what it's costing you to operate that same infrastructure right now. And Vice Mayor, no, to address the future, um, that's where we're able to address that with the zoning ordinance change. Um, we, I know we're already addressing light pollution. Um, it's very easy if it's not already in there to have a requirement that street lights are LED lights going forward. So these would may not be required. So future ones, the develop when the developer builds that subdivision would be LED and then they're handling everything that's existing right now. Good. Everything that's already built Good. they're taking care of and then going forward as it's being built they have to put in LEDs. All right. And the 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 four light fixtures that are here the uh, which ones did we see out there on the road that night? Was that that cobra head or was it the flat silver one? Which slide are you on? He's back a page. Well, I had to I'm back sorry, up because I was trying to catch up. Sorry about that. <laughs> I was moving too fast. So are you on uh, the 24 what? knockdowns? The I-24 yeah, 24 knockdowns. Knockdown. So I don't believe you guys saw any of these mocked up, did we? we? Did yeah, we did not mock up any of these options for the ad, right? You guys did see a, a, a large number of... Well, we went out and looked at five. Mm-hmm. Yes, but lots. not but not any of the I-24 but ones. Not, okay. Yeah. I got you. I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's I'm okay. Sure That's all right. Y'all, please good. feel free to stop me if I'm rolling on. I, I, I'll back up here. I do want to... And Bruce was very good to me, but uh, one of the things when they were here, when you guys were here before, was... Uh, I guess I just wanted to know about your company, how long you've been around, sure. what other, uh, who's your nemesis, or you might say, yeah, that's sure. in your, okay. I mean, I hate to just go with one, we've only got one option, sure. and not be able to pick and choose. Sure, that's a fair question, absolutely. I'll give you some quick background. So we were founded in 2017. Um, our founders are Russ Phillips and Nathan Wells. Russ previously worked at a large Fortune 500 company. Um, he was based in Memphis. Um, inside of the streetlight conversion space, there have, there have been zero projects done. Um, and while working at that company, Russ successfully developed and implemented the first citywide streetlight conversion project. That was in Paris, Tennessee. Um, in doing that and working for the company he was working for, he uncovered, of course, many inefficiencies, frankly, just large overhead costs, and decided he could do it more efficiently if he stepped out and formed his own company. 
Um, so in 2017, that company was started um, under the premise that there were simply better ways to do streetlight conversion projects. We've since mm -hmm. expanded our skill set, and we do a ton of other things that I could ramble on for hours about. But streetlight conversion projects are still one of our core competencies. Um, like I said before, in terms of the number of projects and who our nemesis might be, um, I'd like to say we don't have any at this point because nobody can touch the number of projects we've completed. We've done more projects than everybody else combined. Um, the number of projects successfully implemented by any of our competitors, I don't think anybody's done more than one individual project. And at this point, we've done you know, more than a dozen. Um, so I can't tell you that we actually have a nemesis inside of this space. I will tell you nationwide, there's a couple companies that have done some big cities like Amoresco, um, Noresco, uh, Siemens. Those large Fortune 500 companies, they've done cities like Los Angeles and Phoenix and Chicago and Boston and Philadelphia. Um, however, we are competing with them head to head on a number of projects and have successfully won. The city of Columbia did a nationwide RFQ for this, um, which is not required, it was just simply something they wanted to do. They did a nationwide RFQ, which we won, and we successfully developed and, and implemented their project over a year ago. So Columbia's lights are up and They're running. They're up and done, and so they've been up and running for about a year. pick up the phone and call. Call or? Tony Massey, city manager over there. He's been wonderful, or Mayor Mulder. Um, yeah, absolutely. Feel you free ever, to bet us. You ever feel like we're on Shark Tank here? <laughs> <laughs> so. I feel like it a little bit. <laughs> uh, okay, I mean, I just, is there any other cities around besides Columbia? Sure, yeah, so we're, we're developing the city of Brentwood project right now. Gulletsville is probably a very relevant project for you guys. They're inside of the NES territory. Um, and so that's a project I think that's been done now for about a year and a half. Um, so that's okay. another one that's easy. You can go check on it. And then over in West Tennessee, there's a number of them. So, and then in all of Mississippi as well. Well, I have to say, when we went out and looked at those lights, I personally, and I think everybody on this board did, they, they definitely, definitely make a difference. There's no doubt. There's uh, no doubt about I it. I talked to maybe the police chief, maybe not, I don't remember, uh, about the safety aspect and the way it looked. And that seemed to be a, that seemed to be the biggest thing. <clears throat> okay, go ahead. I'll, no, sure, I'll compliment rambling. you on your recognition of, or recognition of those benefits. So those are things that can't necessarily be quantified in this presentation, right? And this is purely the economics of it. So the fact that you're, you're realizing those, I would commend you on. Uh, to continue going through here, I guess, you know, we just talked about the residential fixtures, so we'll flip now to option three, which is a Cheney Road new fixture. So these are fixtures, you know, over there by uh, the high school, of course. Um, the idea, of course, is that light levels aren't where we'd like for them to be. Um, this is a request from, from you guys, and so the solution is to add four new cover head fixtures to the existing poles and actually install one new pole. The cost of that option to add is $12,700. I'll kind of breeze through these and then you know, you guys ask individual questions or we can talk questions at the end. All right, moving on to the next one, number four, which is just an underlit area. Um, you know, we were coming through this area earlier today over there, you know, kind of close to the Walgreens, but basically it's the same, same problem set here, low light levels present, add new fixtures, add new poles. Um, there's two different options here. We could simply add one fixture at the intersection, um, which would cost roughly $5,300 or we can actually choose to extend that light to be more consistent along that roadway all the way, I guess it's to the, would that be to the northeast um, of that intersection and that's the addition of three new poles. The cost of all of that combined would then be $19,000. Okay. Moving on, option number five is another underlit area. This is at the intersection of Murfreesboro Road and Stones River Road. Um, again, the solution here is to add one new fixture, one new fixture with a new pole. The cost of doing that is $5,300 as well. All right. And finally, option six, again, another underlit area. Uh, this is really as you head south towards I-24. Um, there's a section of road there um, on Waldron Road that's underlit right now. It just has no lights. Um, and so we're talking about adding three new mongoose fixtures to the existing poles. Anytime you can utilize existing poles, I would recommend that you might choose to do those options. The cost of doing those <coughs> options is obviously less than adding new infrastructure. Um, so the cost of adding three of those poles is actually $8,000. I'm sorry, three new fixtures on existing poles is $8,000. Okay. Any questions on any of those options? And the, the electric companies work good with you guys? Absolutely. And they have to run wires and stuff? They absolutely. work good with you? Yes, absolutely. Both NES and Middle Tennessee, we've got great relationships with. They've actually been wonderful partners in developing these projects. Um, 
you know, the NES relationship goes all the way back to that Goodlettsville project years ago. Uh, I'd say we started developing that relationship with them probably three or four years ago prior to that project. Middle Tennessee has been more of a recent one, but they've been fantastic to work with. Now, I know whenever we were discussing number six, which is the three new fixtures on Waldron Road, um, I don't know if y'all had a chance to go back and look at that because there was some discussion about the one closest to the McDonald's okay. as far as side. possible needs with that. We, we know that across the street from there is going to be a, a pretty well lit racetrack. Okay. And so um, that may impact the, the visuals there as to whether, sure. or not that, whether or not that's actually needed. Okay. Um, so I don't know if y'all if y'all had a chance to look at that yet. We didn't weigh in. Oh, we, oh, we didn't have those plans to like compare what these are. Those are not included. Okay. But I can, I can yeah. Those yeah. Kyle may have some information on that with plan, through planning. So if we do this, uh, how long does it take to get it all put up? And like Mayor Cole just said, if we if we plan on a light going there and then something opens up and it brightens up and then we find out that we don't need it, do we get a reduced rate for that light or do we put it somewhere else that we could? I would say within reason, right? I mean, if you're, if you're taking out one light here or there, that's easy for us to adjust. If you're taking out, you know, whole streets at a time, it starts to get pretty complicated because at that point we've sunk, you know, we've actually ordered equipment. Um, I would like to make those decisions on the front end if at all possible, to your point, Mayor. Um, so I think if there are other areas where we think the infrastructure is going to be undergoing significant changes in the near future, I think that's something we should be weighing right now versus trying to do it three months from now. Yep. Yep. Um, sure. Yeah. So, so what Nathan Malik is asking me to highlight is that the savings associated with this project, I don't know if you guys remember how your streetlight bill is currently made up. But it basically, you have a portion of your bill that you pay for the energy utilized by the fixtures, and then you have a certain portion of your bill that is made up of the investment charge. And what that really is, is both NES and Middle Tennessee Electric, when they go put up a new light, they cover the costs up front. And over time, they get paid back for that through the investment charge. Um, by doing this project, you are going to almost eliminate that investment charge. So you'll immediately see significant savings when you retire that existing plant. And then you'll see ongoing savings as the energy charge, as we actually install new lights and the energy starts to fall, you'll see those energy charges start to impact your bill as well. So talk to me real quick about um, warranty with these sure. lights. If, uh, if they are damaged mm -hmm. um, or for whatever reason just stopped working, it's technology. That's just that. Absolutely. It happens. It does. So talk to us about that. Yep. So, so standard manufacturer warranty on these lights is 10 years, right? They're rated to last 22 years. I can talk all about how that rating comes into play. It's actually not a, it's going to fail at 22 years. It's what's called an L70 life for anybody that's studied LEDs. Um, what that means, LEDs don't simply just fail, not like a standard incandescent bulb, right, that just burns out. LEDs slowly fade. And so an L70 life is when it gets to be 70% effective versus its original 100% rate. So at 22 years, it is going to be 70% as effective as it was at day one. Okay, so it's not like at 22 years even, you're gonna have a mass failure event at that point. If anything ever does fail, it tends to be the driver's mayor, to your point, it's a piece of technology, right? Um, but that 10-year manufacturer warranty is key. Usually in the installation of these, what we see is that if it's going to fail, especially inside of that 10-year window, but most of the time inside of that 20-year window, industry studies have said it will fail within the first two to three months. Most of the time within the first two to three days. Okay, so if it's going to fail, we're still going to be on site. It's a warranty claim. We process it. You guys never see it. We put a new one back up, make sure everything's up and running by the time we're done with this project. I'm assuming there's also questions about, hey, three years down the road, when something happens and a fixture fails, what happens at that point? Both NES and Middle Tennessee Electric are going to continue to own, operate, maintain these fixtures. You guys simply log a service request like you standardly do. Hey, we've got a light out at blank, blank address. They come out, they replace it. They then file the warranty claim through us. You guys don't have to do anything extra on your end. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes. Now, with your uh, with your experience with other municipalities that so y'all have done this for, what's the average um, that you actually see them? I know they're they're rated for 22 years. The warranty's 10, but what what are you seeing them actually 
um, their, their lifespan. Sure. Being. So I can give you like a failure rate per year. Would that help you? Sure. Yeah. So failure rate per year tends to be well below 1%. We document in our in our forecast here. We're doc, we're forecasting for two percent a year is what we're forecasting for. So when it's when you're thinking about maintenance allowances and what it might cost to go back out and repair that failed light, obviously it's covered under warranty. There's still labor associated with that. We're forecasting for well above what actually we end up seeing. Okay. And so and with that ten-year warranty, we need to plan to have uh, Vice Mayor No go out at year nine and hit all the lights there you go there you go That's we exactly. have a don't we go have a tendency and i and i say that very lightly to have power surges mm -hmm. <laughs> how do they do with power surges sure. and i'm talking it might be one or two and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden on a stormy night it might be seven or eight sure so without getting too technical on you i can tell you yeah, these are don't. these are are super super high grade utility grade fixtures so they are meant to withstand those surges that are considered regular inside of a utility space which surges are regular um, and so there's a ton of studies that go into developing the infrastructure to withstand those surges this is not even like an LED fixture you'd put in here, which is meant to withstand minor power surges, these are meant to withstand significant ones. I can't tell you though, if a lightning strike hits a pole, that that fixture's not gonna go out. I, I, I can't replicate that. Well, no, I don't right. expect that, but sure. we do have power surges quite a, sometimes uh, quite a bit in sure. this wonder. So I guess that brings me to the, to the final question. You've been in business for five years. Sure. Uh, we're if we do this we're going to spend the citizens money mm -hmm. uh, I don't there, I don't guess there's any way you can guarantee you guys uh, financially sound you're going to be around everything's good sure it, it's a good That's question if you're asking about the warranty piece so the warranty is actually it's not our warranty it's a manufacturer's warranty so we don't manufacture anything right these are large major manufacturers US based manufacturers huge Fortune 500 companies publicly traded. So that's who the warranty is being provided by. I like to think, of course, we're not going out of business anytime soon. Um, but even if that happened, the warranty is handled by the manufacturer, not by us. Okay. Yep. So after we get past the 10 years, sure. Um, let's say we do this, we get past the 10 years, light goes out for whatever reason. What's the typical cost of that light? Oh man, you're talking 10 years from now, what's the cost? Yeah, uh, well, the, the, what the current cost would be that, I mean, yeah. we know it'll go up with as far as inflation time, but sure. what, what does that roughly look like? Because that's something that, um, while we may not be dealing with it, future boards may be in 10 years. Absolutely. So. So, so if you look at this project and what it's costing per fixture for this project, that's probably the fairest way possible. Um, the way it's breaking down on this project is, is roughly $600 a fixture. Okay, now that does not necessarily include whatever labor is going to be at that point. I, it's really hard to estimate, but you're not talking thousands and thousands of dollars per fixture to replace them. You're talking hundreds of dollars, hopefully still at that point. I can't speak for inflation, um, but I would say, you know, somewhere between five and eight hundred dollars would be a fair just budget if you wanted to do that at year 13, you know, okay. random number. <clears throat> Anyone else have any other questions? Yeah, you asked the question of wanting to move forward. Sure. And so I just want to throw it out there for the rest of the board to discuss, but I mean, I'm pretty keen on option three, four B, five and six. Okay. Let me... Which totals around 45,000 round numbers on a $2.3 million deal. Three. My question is, and this is for, I've had this question before, on number three, and this is for staff, are all those blue dots, are they still in the seat of Laverne? This is up by the high school. Can we confirm that? I don't think it is, but. I wanna say that, that uh, Sergeant Stats, who was there that night was saying that that area is in um, inside Laverne. Is there a way we can confirm that? Y'all talk to our mapper. Right? Yeah, so we've got the official city boundaries. We, if I could bring it up, I'd show you. But um, we've got the official city boundaries to make sure stuff like that doesn't happen. Okay. And, and it does fall within those city boundaries as far as, and that's the official city map. Yep. The right now. I, I just want to make sure it's in Laverne. Absolutely, before yeah. you go pay to upgrade it. Yep. <coughs> Smyrna, but they 
we want them to pay for theirs. It seems you. like we've had that conversation with the fire chief before. So that's what I want to throw there, boys, so. is that those ones I'm looking at, obviously number one is the big one, the yeah. million dollars for the interstate. That's, it's a big number. I mean, we can discuss it some more. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's a big number. Number two, replacement of the decorative full cut of upgrades, 169. Again, up discussion. But I'm certainly uh, three, you know, three, 4B, five, and six. I'm, I think the under areas that are indicated, we all know it, we drive them, I think are very positive to do. And that comes out to yeah. what, $45,085? Yeah, $45,000. Okay. I, I, I would agree with that. I mean, that improves. If we're looking at improving visibility and safety in the city, those, those are, are definitely good ones to start on. And then we can always, um, us or future boards can always go back if they decide that they want to look at the 24 knockdowns. I know TDOT has to be part of that conversation as well, so sure. that's not just a us discussion. And then there needs to, in my opinion, I think there needs we need to look more into two with um, that decorative, those decorative ones, because I, I've still got a lot of questions on those. So you think we need to do out there by I-24? No. No. Okay. Uh, all right. No. I, I misunderstood you. Yeah. Yes, I, I don't need to. Yes. So, so, so number one, uh, you know, the I-24, no. Okay. I got we, you. We can do some further study, but it's a million dollars is a lot of money compared to the rest of the project. The decorative, I think, is personal preference. But certainly the other ones, the under areas, I, I think we need to get those moving. It's safe for the citizens. It's relatively a small cost compared to the rest of the, rest of the project, and it does lighten up areas that I think needs to be further lit. And Chiefs, you all agree with the light and safety and brightness and all of that helping? Yes, sir, we do. <clears throat> Alvin Waldron, Vice Mayor No, what are your thoughts on those options? Well, we went out there and looked at the lights. It's definitely a difference, uh, makes a difference in the, the lights that y'all put up and the lights was already there. Sure. But it's a, we're talking about a lot of money. Sure. You know. It's, uh, but you know, it, it, it did, I could tell the difference. Right. One, one quick question I forgot to ask, um, if you can comment on, I want to say the question that was asked to me before was asked about whether it's, these are, it was either warm or cold LEDs or if it was blue LED. Sure. Yeah. You can so, speak to that. Absolutely. Yeah. So what you're referring to is, is color temperature, right? In the lighting design space, there's color temperature and there's brightness and they're two different things. So color temperature is the color of the light, right? Self-explanatory brightness is the amount of light that is being output by that fixture itself. In the color temperature space, it is rated in Kelvin, okay, is mm -hmm. the range. And you have anything realistically, um, in the street light space, you have anything from, let's say, 2200 Kelvin up to five or 6,000 Kelvin. And the higher the number, the bluer the light is. Um, the fixtures that we are recommending for this project are right at 3,000 Kelvin. So they're a little bit wider and brighter than what you have right now, but they're not this old blue. We all remember when LEDs first came out, every LED was blue, blue, real blue. Um, what has happened is there have been tons and tons of studies about color temperature and the negative impacts that something that's too high in color temperature, so really anything over 3,000, has negative impacts on a number of different environmental factors, right? Whether it's migration of birds or turtles or sleep habits of humans or all kinds of things. I'm not gonna argue with that science. I will just tell you it's probably not worth arguing with. Um, and 3000 seems to fit well within those studies and saying that is an, uh, an absolutely permissible level. It maximizes the benefit to the human eye um, while also not negatively impacting anything else. Does that answer your question? Yes, and that, that well, more uh, uh, appropriately, it, it answers the question that was asked to me by a resident. So, because gotcha. that's what they were talking about sure. was the effects on animals and humans. Yep. So, so that what they are asking is, is it dark sky compliant? So, there's an organization called the National Dark Sky <clears throat> Alliance. Um, they are the ones that do those studies. And so, when somebody asks that question, they're asking, is it dark sky compliant? And these are all dark sky compliant. Okay. Yep. Good question. They uh, don't. I wouldn't mess with them. It's all I'm saying. <laughs> and, yep. and, and just one other question, because this ties in with our, our zoning ordinance that we're working on in Planning Commission is, um, how is how is the perception, because I know we saw a limited number of them, usually mm -hmm. it was one or two on a, on a yeah. row, um, but whenever you do such a large project, how's the impact on light pollution? 
Oh, yeah, it's a great question. So it's another dark sky compliant type of question, light pollution. So there's no uplight that comes from it. That is one aspect of dark sky compliant. So from a light pollution standpoint, you have nothing above the fixture, which is great. Um, talking about light pollution into yards, right? So old fixtures, if you think about how a bulb works, it literally just glows. And you try your best through refractors to direct that light wherever you want it. With LED fixtures, we're all familiar with the number of diodes, right? They have a number of diodes. And in the design process, you can actually individually direct each one of those. What you're trying to do then is throw the light exactly where you want it along the road. So if you look at the way an LED fixture spreads light, it's not in just a circle like an old lamp would. It's actually in a, a almost rectangle, right, along the road up until the next fixture, and then it's another rectangle. So you minimize the amount of light pollution both back in t into somebody's yard also into restaurants or neighboring condos or apartments or anything like that. Okay. okay. Yep. Remember, we had a lot of questions yeah. about that. Oh, I, I still got a headache, bro. <laughs> uh, so you got Columbia and Goodlesville. Sure. In terms of complete projects? Yeah. Nearby? Yes, those would be the well, two I Well, I think for at. me, what I would like to do before I make a, my decision is, is I'd just like to mm -hmm. talk to the people, talk, you know, call Absolutely. down there and talk. Call Tim Ellis in Gillettsville, city manager there. Um, Tony Massey in Columbia, city manager there. Those were two, you can call whoever you want in those. I would tell you those are the two in each municipality who probably know the most about the project, both the aesthetic benefits, the public perception benefits, and also the economic benefits to the cities. I also want to make sure, Vice Mayor, know that I answered your question earlier about timeline. Uh, you asked a question and we somehow got derailed. Um, timeline. So it's a multi-million dollar question literally right now in terms of procurement right we're all familiar with procurement issues happening right now um nathan made the, the analogy earlier it's somewhat kind of like the car industry where you can have the entire fixture built and you're waiting on a chip uh i would tell you procurement of fixtures right now is looking like somewhere between 12 and 16 weeks which is a pretty long amount of time i would tell you a year ago that was reduced by a month to a month and a half so it's really long right now once we get them though, once we get everything staged up, which doesn't take very long, the total install process for this project is roughly three months. You'll actually see probably 80% of the fixtures go up significantly quicker. And then like any project, there's a bunch of punch list things and special projects that have to happen. But three months is what I would consider your, okay, we saw the first light go up and now they're out of town, you know, all the lights are done. All right. Okay. This might be a famous question. Uh, since we didn't budget, these lights on this year's budget, where are we going to get the money? Where are we going to take the money out of to pay for it? This, we're, we're not ready for that question yet because <laughs> right now, basically, we're just looking at the options we want to add to this study. Okay. Once we give them those options that we want them to move forward with, they are going to prepare a proposal for the project. During that process, we will discuss how it's going to be funded, where the funds are going to come from, how we're going to pay for it, and then you guys will have to vote on that before we even move forward at all. So we're just at a, still at a very beginning step to determine what we want to be included before we really get into figuring out how to pay for it. Yeah, the, the, this is just the options phase. Right, right. So we know what the basic is. Do we, which of these options do we want to add on and go from there? So, but I, I will agree I, I, with Alderman Coates's um, as far as suggestions, Vice Mayor No and Alderman Waldron, do you have any others or any any different view on those? I, I think Graham's on point. I misunderstood him at first, but you know, once I figured out his English, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I think the city needs it. I think it's uh, ready. As the chiefs say, it's a it's a safety thing. Uh, yes, there's money involved, but what part of what part of trying to find the finance for it do you match against safety protocol? So, you know, how many of us have, have, would like to have a nice street light in front of our house for safety? You know, Alderman Walter. Uh, we we just have to look it over. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you all for your time. I appreciate it. We'll get to work on that feedback and uh, get back with you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Moving back in, we have got motion to approve an old Nashville Highway Improvements Participation Agreement with Jackson's Station LP. 
Um, this is an agreement uh, for Jackson Station LP to pay a, a, sh a share of the road improvements for Old Nashville Highway. Um, there was a site plan that was approved on the 31st of May. It is um, for a high density zoning district that's been there for quite a number of years at 317 Old Nashville Highway. The site plan has 60 units comprised of one and two bedroom apartments. Um, this was approved with the attached agreement subject, well, the approval was subject to this attached agreement being approved by the Board of Mayor and Aldermen. If it is approved, the developer will pay the city $175,000 to defray a portion of the city's cost to design and construct improvements for Old Nashville Highway. If this is approved, the developer must pay that amount within five days of approval from the Board of Mayor and Aldermen. Is there any questions? Is this talking about the highway as a whole or that turning lane they've got to put in? This would go towards the improvements, uh, basically for design and construction for improvements for Old Nashville Highway as a whole. So we know it's, it's going to be significant costs. Mayor, I do want to emphasize, and I failed to put this in the summary sheet, this is over and above the impact fees. Yes. So they will still have to pay impact fees. This is just an additional portion due to the impact that the, this development would make. But this would this would be used for uh, specifically for that. So it wouldn't just go to the general fund, be in the general fund for any use. It would be specifically tied to this project. Does anyone have any other questions? Moving on to appoint or remove board and committee members. First, we have the Laverne Housing Authority. We've got one term vacant which is Patricia Williams McLean. Um, the housing authority itself removed her due to lack of attendance. We have been advertising this on Channel 3 and on social media. And um, as currently, we have three applicants. We have uh, Regina Hunsicker, uh, Quinita Waller, and Deborah Harding. And um, this is appointed by me. And so that will occur but if anyone else wants to apply you have till I believe uh, Tuesday to apply we have one term vacant for the Laverne Library Board and um, I believe Bruce I've got to get I've got one applicant sitting in my inbox right now I know I need to get over to you um, but if anyone else would like to apply for this board um, again you have until Tuesday to get that application in and you can find that application on the LavernTN.gov website and then this is just an FYI for the board but the uh, Economic Development Advisory Committee we have got one term that is expiring on um, June 30th the term for um, Floyd Dennis Jim Anderson. Jim Anderson. Well, it says in the packet, Floyd. I'm sitting here looking why Jim's <laughs> highlighted and Floyd's name's in here. So, <laughs> Jim Anderson, um, we will reach out to him and see if he wants to stay on this committee. But um, we will begin advertising that on Channel 3 and social media as well. This item will not be on Tuesday's meeting. With that, Mayor and Alderman comments. Alderman Waldron. I want everybody to check on the elderly. Uh, the days is warming up. Uh, make sure your pets has got fresh water and shelter. And again, keep the Belcher family and everybody's prayers for their loss. That's it. Thank you, sir. Alderman Coates. No comments this evening, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Vice Mayor now. Oh, I got a bunch. <laughs> No, I got some shout outs. I always like to embarrass, but I want to shout out to our codes department. Randolph and his bunch is really going around town. They're making a big difference. They're getting things cleaned up, and I love it. The dog park is uh, coming along great. Uh, you guys went out to Vegas, made us proud, even though we threw trash in the wrong garbage can. Uh, Saturday. Saturday at the Church of Christ, 
9 to 12. If, you, if you've got some families or friends or neighbors or relatives, please get them to go up there. Church of Christ always puts on a big thing and, and gives food out to, the, to people in need. And uh, they'd love to have you. They always have more than, than, they, than they need. And Saturday, of course, Farmer's Market. And the Senior Center will be there with its world-famous banana pudding. That's it. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I do want to piggyback for the uh, Laverne Church of Christ Mobile Food Bank, um, not only for those people that may need food, but um, they are looking for volunteers. And so the truck will be there, if I remember correctly, around 7 a.m. So if you'd like to come and help uh, hand out food, by all means, they definitely uh, said that they could need some help. Um, we do have the farmer's market going on Saturday, and I believe we also have at the Laverne Library summer reading kickoff, so be sure to go by there and uh, check that out. And uh, with that, I'm going to call this meeting adjourned. <laughs>